All right. Well, I'll get I'll get started again. Um, so before the break, I was talking about priors, and I have um, a couple more things to say about priors um, before I move on to the next topic, which will be shrinkage. Um, so just to review, we looked at sort of three different ways of thinking about priors. Priors as um, encoding knowledge in some sense, priors as providing regulation or regularization, I should say, against um, sort of unphysical or, or mathematically um, sort of unallowed or un undesirable types of posteriors, and uh, priors as a representation of, of your data generating process or to complete the generative model. Um, and one sort of final piece of advice I think is worth saying, uh, somewhat sort of just practical advice uh, on choosing priors, is that it's generally best to work with priors which act on um, sort of on physical quantities as, as um, close as it's possible to describe them. So um, for this particular example, we would have, um, say, like uh, we have a covariance function um, which, which describes the Gaussian process. And the prior we want to choose um, is, uh, is going to describe in some way the, um, the length scale of that parameter. So how, how related are, um, say, are two neighboring villages uh, of a given distance. Um, and so what you want to do is choose a prior on the, or to parameterize your model so that you can choose a prior on something which is actually a length scale, so a range expressed um, you know, di directly, linearly as the range. So this would probably have an inherent scale for a spatial model in terms of kilometers. And if we write our model like this, then we can say, well, we'll choose a prior on the range. It, it, it's, we div it's something which uh, divides the distance. So the distance will be in kilometers. Uh, the range will sort of inherently be in kilometers as well. Um, and it, it's a natural framework for us to think about. Um, it gets much more difficult to choose priors uh, if, you structure, if you write down your model uh, to look, say, for example, like this, where uh, now we're looking at the range squared. So we have to choose a prior which is on something that has a sort of units, if you like, of kilometers squared, but it's not an area. So it's like, well, oh, I'm not quite sure what it should be. And then even more, you know, we shoot ourselves in the foot is to structure the model or parameterize it like this, where we've um, written our range parameter as an inverse squared range. So now it's uh, in units of per kilometer squared. And we're really like lost to just have a physical intuition of what any given number for beta is going gonna, is gonna to mean, or at least I find it very difficult to think about it that way. Um, so my first piece of advice is that you want to try to write your model in such a way that when you then choose a prior, <coughs> it's, it's uh, more straightforward. Um, often you can run into some problems when you're using a particular probabilistic programming language uh, where that piece of software you're using may have chosen one of these undesirable parameterizations. So you may be having a code where you're only allowed in that code to specify a prior on one of these nastier sort of um, versions of the parameter or parameterizations. Um, and so what you'll need to do, um, and you can sort of like refer back to this if this comes up uh, in, in your model fitting, um, is to, you want to go ahead and choose your prior on the physical quantity, on the range that you want to deal with, um, and then you want to translate that nice prior on the nice parameter to, a, um, to what prior it implies on the transformed parameter. Um, and for most, uh, most models, uh, most sort of uh, distributions and parameters, uh, it will work such that you just simply need to um, account for the Jacobian of the inverse um, transformation term. So to go through this properly, we have um, uh, imagine that our desired prior uh, is, is expressed in terms of the transformation of our base parameter um, x. So basically, um, in this case, we would have um, the, the range here would be x. So that's the thing which we, uh, which we, have, a, a, which, you know, which we have a good prior for. Um, and our transformed parameter is y. Um, so in that other example, it might have been like uh, our y would have been the beta parameter, um, which, we, which our model, our, sort of our code is telling us we have to choose a prior for. <coughs> so um, 
we know that they're related by some kind of uh, nonlinear transformation. Um, and so what we want to do is, um, is come up with or transform our prior on X, so our natural prior on the range, into a parameter, into a prior, into a prior density on the transformed parameter. So the way it works is that um, F would be the density, so it's like the normal density, um, which we've chosen to describe our density on the range. Um, we can plug in uh, simply the inverse transform of Y into that, um, and sort of as a, as a first step, that's might, that might be you know, where you would intuitively feel like you're allowed to stop. Um, but unfortunately, to ensure that um, the densities are working correctly, we need to corre correct for the fact um, that we're actually um, uh, having a change of variables uh, type of problem in, in, our, in the base measure of our integration. So we have to take the derivative of this inverse transformation. Um, to make that more concrete, I'll look at a specific example. Um, so in the bug software package, also the JAG software package, which I think from the survey at least one or two people had used, um, the normal distribution, which we're familiar with uh, in the last couple of days, um, is taking this type of parameterization where you can give it a, um, a standard deviation. And like a standard deviation being in natural units is something that you can kind of get a good handle on. Um, unfortunately, JAG says, uh, you know, you can't, don't give us a standard deviation. Give us a precision parameter, which is the inverse of the standard deviation squared. And it asks you to specify a parameter on this. Um, and I think because bugs has been so influential in uh, sort of epidemiological studies and lots of other studies, I think this, <clears throat> this, uh, parameterization choice has really ruined a lot of, of um, statistical results um, because it's, it's so unintuitive. Um, so if we had decided for ourselves that we would like to use a, um, a gamma 10-10 um, prior on the standard deviation, um, we haven't talked much about the gamma prior um, in the previous lectures. Um, I think Brendan mentioned it was sort of a, um, uh, equivalent to a Schechter function. Um, a normalized Schechter function, basically, but um, it's, a, it's a probability density which um, uh, sort of is defined over all the positive real numbers, and for that reason, you'd usually choose it as a prior um, on something like a standard deviation, which has to be positive. Um, this particular choice uh, sets, um, in fact, I'd say if you want to understand more about the gamma, uh, Almost every statistician, I would say, uses Wikipedia at least once a week because the Wikipedia descriptions of the probability densities are just like a fantastic resource. So to understand precisely the gamma parameterization you could, and how it works, you can check on there. Um, the brief summary of this, the gamma 1010 10 prior, would concentrate um, sort of uh, most of its mass around one, so a standard deviation of one, um, and it would be fairly tightly, tightly concentrated about that. Um, if you go to a gamma prior of one and one, then it makes like a extraordinarily diffuse, almost non-informative prior. Um, so if we have this prior and we want to use that, it's a prior we've defined on something we understand, like the standard deviation, then uh, what t sort of prior do we actually then need to enforce within bugs or jags in order to achieve this, with bugs and jags asking us for the beta parameter? Um, the way we, that we do that is to follow this type of um, uh, prescription from, uh, from the Jacobian to write down first this uh, inverse transformation of how do we turn a beta parameter into a standard deviation. Uh, we want to differentiate that um, in, in absolute sense, uh, which we know how to do. And then we multiply that, uh, as suggested by the formula, um, we multiply that against the gamma prior in which um, we just input uh, the transform or the inverse transformation to get the standard deviation uh, back out. In code, it looks, or at least in our code, it looks something like this. Um, uh, so this is the, the, what the gamma 1010 prior looks like uh, for um, the standard deviation. This is like 10,000 draws uh, from that prior. And um, uh, we have our transformation to get what beta looks like. So we can see um, what, if we just transform these draws into a beta, how they look. Um, and what, so what we want to do is say, um, 
uh, this code here produces a um, well, produces this plot here. So it just says draw um, draw a bunch of parameters from our prior on sigma, uh, transform them into a beta, um, plot a histogram with the sigma with lots of breaks, and then um, put the red kind of probability density line on top so that we can confirm that our, our, our histogram, uh, which represents the data we drew, actually looks like the, the um, probability density we specified. So that's good. If we would want to take, um, make the same type of, uh, of prior, but on the transform parameter beta, then um, we, can, we can show how that looks by simply trans transforming our drawers and making the histogram, which comes up here. But then if we would want to write out or like plot the um, implied probability density, then we take the gamma density with um, the sort of inverse transformation plugged in, and then we have to adjust it by the, the, this uh, Jacobian scaling factor, uh, which is like to the power of um, negative three on two, uh, which, we, which we had computed earlier. And if we do that, we can verify that the, um, that the transformation formula did work correctly um, because the, the density we draw on matches the density implied by the histogram. Um, it might seem like a kind of a dry, uh, like technical topic, but um, uh, these, this kind of mistake of not writing down, um, of not transforming or allowing for transformations of, of densities uh, is, uh, is very easy to make, um, particularly when you start using um, one of these really awesome codes like STAN or JAGS that do all the sampling for you, um, but they don't sort of um, guard explicitly against these type of user errors. Um, so, the, ooh, this has, so the next topic I'd like to talk about um, is this idea of shrinkage. So a very powerful feature of hierarchical models um, and the type of regulation that they, regularization that they provide is this thing called shrinkage. Um, I say this is best understood by beginning with Stein's paradox. Um, you, you, like individual results may vary, um, but I think it's very nice to look at Stein's paradox because one, it is like genuinely a paradox, and two, it gives you a feel for um, uh, this issue of this so-called bi bias variance trade-off, which you hear a lot about in statistics and, and machine learning. So um, Stein's paradox is this. Um, if we imagine that we um, have a collection of n sort of objects um, th that we, uh, we're going to observe, and that for each of the objects, the object has some kind of true underlying parameter, which we'll call mu. Um, we're not able to observe that directly, but um, we can observe it um, with normally distributed uncertainties um, of width one, of, of sort of a of standard deviation one. Um, and, and so we're going to do that experiment, and then we're going to use these observations z uh, in order to try to estimate um, what these underlying parameters were for each of the, the objects in our sample. So we have a single observation uh, of the hidden parameter for each object. It has normal density one, um, and these, uh, these are independently distributed. So um, uh, there's, no, there's no hidden correlations between the uncertainties or in, in the sampling function. Uh, it's, they're just, um, uh, just simple normal observations. So one way to write that is to write that in the sort of um, prescriptive form, like for each of the observation for each of the objects, one to n, uh, we will take a normally a single normally distributed observation. Um, another way to say that is that for all of the objects in one single go, we'll take a multivariate normal observation uh, in which the covariance function is the sort of uh, the simple diagonal matrix. So um, they're all independent. Um, and it's just another way to sort of write exactly the same thing as the first line. What, what makes this a paradox, or the first thing that, that, yeah, so the first ingredient in order to see that this is a paradox um, is to add this observation that um, these are independent draws. So, um, uh, sorry, they're independent draws, which is important. Um, but more importantly, the, um, uh, the objects which we're going to observe, um, we're going to assume that they're not, um, 
inherently related in some way, or at least they don't need to be. So we could be considering we're trying to like uh, estimate the, the typical size of oranges in Spain and the length of snakes in England. We don't have a, a real model for why these two numbers might be similar, and you know, and we're not going to assume that they are. Um, but w the reason it's, it becomes out to be a paradox is that. Um, we're going to find that it's better to consider both of those numbers in estimating each one than treating them as entirely separate, um, which, which is really weird. Um, so the two potential estimators that we'll compare are just the um, maximum likelihood estimate for, um, uh, for each of the unknown parameters, the mu's. So the maximum likelihood estimate in this case would just be to say, we'll take as our estimator um, the observed realization of all of those random variables. So we'll go along, uh, you know, take uh, the noisy observation of, this, of the size of oranges in Spain, take this number, and we'll just treat that as our estimate of the size of oranges in Spain. And for the length of the snakes in England, we will uh, take our single no noisy measurement of the length of snakes in England and treat that as our as our estimate. Um, and so we're not sharing any kind of information uh, between the snakes and the oranges. Um, and so that's fine. That that's, um, seems like a very natural thing to do. Um, and uh, up until uh, sort of um, uh, James Stein uh, published his results, everybody thought that um, there was not just a natural thing to do, but it was the correct thing to do. It was sort of the optimal thing that you could do, because these things aren't related. Why bother to uh, you know to try to combine their information in some way? Um, but what James Stein showed was that in certain cases, um, and in particular in the case that we're comparing more than two objects, so we're comparing not just the size of oranges in Spain, the length of snakes in England, but maybe like the size of waves in Australia. If we have three different things we're comparing, then actually it's possible to do much to do better and sometimes much better than using the maximum likelihood estimate. Um, and to do so, you have to share information uh, between all of those different, um, those, different ob or those different parameters which we're trying to estimate. The way that he proposed his estimator to look like is like this. Uh, it's, it's taking the observations um, of each of those things, the noisy observations we get, and then it, it, does, it scales them by a particular factor, which depends on the absolute sort of sum of squares of all of those observations. Um, and the reason it's called shrinkage is that typically its effect will be to pull those estimates down towards zero. So it just shaves a little bit off the estimate of each one based on how large all of them are together in a sum of squares sense. Um, in this type of problem, it's important to clarify what do we mean by doing better. Um, and so here, by doing better, we'll define, well, we'll define how well we do in terms of this uh, criterion called expected squared loss. And that's defined, this loss function, as the um, sum of squared differences between the true, like the true parameter, which, which we wanted to estimate, um, so like the size of the oranges, the length of the snakes, and so forth, minus, um, uh, minus sorry, the true parameter, I'll say that again, it, it's uh, interchangeable because it's, in, it's uh, squared, but it's the difference between our estimate of the true parameter and the actual value of that parameter. And it's a sum of squares estimate, so um, we're, not, uh, we're not specifically weighting any object uh, more strongly a priori, um, although inherently the, um, the, the larger objects or the larger parameters uh, will contribute most likely, well, may well contribute more to this by their nature. Um, so this is how it looks, um, and that was his claim. Uh, this isn't like the proof of, of how to, to um, uh, sort of fully est establish the theorem, but it's like a sketch of the proof, in, in which I think gives a good idea of how it looks. Um, and so in order to, to get a handle on this, we want to look at um, uh, what does this notion of the expected loss actually mean if we would, if we would expand it out. And if, so we'll just look at the expected loss for, one of, for our estimate of one of the objects, say the size of oranges estimated minus the actual size of oranges. Um, so this squared term can be expanded uh, by adding an auxiliary variable, um, which is um, uh, like, 
our observed, the observation which we got. So this is simply um, uh, writing this as, a, as an expansion, sort of a, it's like a, taut, it's an identity or, or, or a, uh, it's like a tautological uh, algebraic manipulation. And we, do, we compose it into these three terms. So we look at this uh, squared loss as a contribution for how close our estimator is to the actual noisy observation we got a contribution of how far away the true value is, of the parameter is, from the observation we got, um, and then another contribution from uh, the covariance, or, or what we'll see to be the uh, covariance between the, of these differences between the, um, uh, between the distance from the, uh, of the estimator to the noisy observation and from the mean to the noisy observation um, and now, since, we're, um, since we have n objects and not just, not just one, uh, we need to make a sum uh, to get this squared loss, uh, which we wrote down like this. Um, so we have, to, we have to take the sum, we have to sum over all n objects. Um, and because when we're, um, uh, we're not specifically concerned with how well we did in any single case, we want to know how well we're going to do on average, we have to take an expectation of each side. And so the expectation uh, is with respect to our, our noise generating process, so with respect to this um, normal distribution which is adding noise to the observations. Um, so yeah, this, in this way, I guess, is just like another stage at which you see this kind of, uh, the, these two competing terms against each other. Um, in our loss function, we have this penalty for moving away, moving our estimator away from the observed value which we got the noisy value, um, but then hopefully we have this subtractive term, which is this uh, covariance term, which um, if we've not moved too far away here, may well make up for the fact that we know we've moved away from an unbiased estimate to a biased one, um, and, but hopefully we reduce our variance. Um, and this is one example of what is called this bias variance trade-off. Remaining sort of steps to, um, uh, in order to start to evaluate what the loss function actually works out to for specific estimators uh, looks like this. We, um, uh, we want to take the covariance term, which we saw earlier, uh, um, this guy here, and we wanted to um, like find a more tractable way to, um, to work with that. And it turns out there's this identity, uh, there's a missing bracket here, um, but there's an identity which looks like this, which is the expectation with respect to a normal, normally distributed variable of some function multiplied by the difference between the observation and the mean of the normal variable uh, can, be re can be sort of rewritten as the expectation with respect to that random variable of the derivative, derivative of the function. Uh, this is something known as Stein's lemma, um, and the proof is integration by parts. The way to see that is to look at the normal density, which takes that um, do, 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 normal, which takes that um, oh, I want to cross. yeah, which takes this. Um, uh, so there's, the mean is zero here, but for the um, full normal with a mean parameterization, it's it looks like exponential of minus x minus mu squared. And so if you would think um, about uh, the derivatives of the exponential function. Um, uh, we, can, we can take out this um, x minus mu term um, in an integration by parts, and uh, it's possible to derive this sort of trick. So given this, or you know, sort of taking that at, at face value, um, we can plug that back in to our expression for the squared loss and start to look at, um, uh, for the maximum likelihood estimator and for Stein's uh, estimator, what the loss looks like. For the maximum likelihood estimator, um, we can see right away that um, uh, two of these terms go to zero. Uh, the first one here, which took the, the derivative of our estimator, goes to zero by definition because the maximum likelihood occurs at the inflection point, uh, at a point of zero gradients um, of a curve. So this must be zero. And um, it's also sort of, it. it is possible to show that 
in um, expectation, the maximum likelihood estimator is unbiased, uh, so it, on average it should um, be a good reflection of the, um, of the unknown parameter. So the loss for this one reduces down to n. For Stein's estimator, the expression uh, breaks down into these two parts. The, um, uh, the question then is w whether um, the difference between, uh, this should be a minus here. Um, oh, sorry, no, that's, um, uh, it's negative valued, so it's all right. Um, but yeah, whether the difference or the, the sum of these two parts is such that um, uh, we'll have a net loss or net reduction from the absolute loss. And uh, so for Stein's estimator, sorry, yeah, for Stein's estimator, the expression looks like this. Um, uh, to begin with, we have to evaluate these two terms. They're both analytically uh, relatively difficult to work with. And so I'll, I leave this, um, uh, you can look at uh, a number of proofs online of, of um, the derivation of, of Stein's result. Um, but basically you can uh, obtain that this second term uh, reduces down such that it, it depends on an expectation of the um, inverse sum of squares of all of the um, uh, of all of the objects in the basket, um, and so if n is greater than two, then this term will be positive, and it will be subtracted from n um, as the as the, which is a default loss, of the maximum likelihood estimator. So um, uh, this means two things. One, we know that Stein's lemma only applies for n greater than two, um, and the other thing is that it's going to be of greatest advantage when the um, sort of the absolute uh, size of the um, parameters we're trying to estimate is small, which sort of makes sense because um, Stein's estimator, as it's defined here, is shrinking everything towards zero. So we've said that everything is going to come back down towards zero. That choice of zero was in fact an arbitrary point, and so there may well have been, for a given basket of, of goods or whatever, a, um, an, a, a different point which was actually optimal to shrink towards. But um, uh, Stein's lemma shows that even if we don't know what that point is, and we just choose zero, that for higher dimensions, dimensions greater than two, uh, we'll still do better in expectation uh, in terms of the square loss than the actual um, maximum likelihood estimator. So it's, it's a paradox. Um, you know, why should we want to conflate these, the observations of these completely unrelated objects? Um, I think. It's, it's something which has pu puzzled statisticians and philosophers, uh, you know, for many years, and it's not. There's no simple answer that I've seen that, it, that properly explains it, or you know, other than simply working through the mathematics for a given example to to show it in a um, sort of in an abstract sense. But one way to think about it is this thing called uh, Galton's approach, um, in which you imagine that the Stein estimator comes from performing. A, uh, a linear or, f or some kind of functional regression of um, the observed noisy Z values against the imagined to be known true values. So the idea would be that um, by our, our best estimate for what should, of what should be this one-to-one -one relationship uh, would be something which um, takes into account not a single observation, but in fact all of the observations together. Um, the particular example of, um, of Stein's lemma that we looked at here was only for normally distributed observations. In fact, there are versions which have been found for other types of observations, so for Poisson random variables and things, so if a basket of, your basket of goods that somebody gives you is, has inherently a Poisson noise process, um, you, get, you can derive the same kind of result. Um, so the point really here is that it's, it's not, um, the point here of showing the Stein estimator is not to say that um, uh, we're going to use this particular formula in any of our work. This is like a, um, uh, a, a classical uh, frequentist style of estimator, but it's to give some kind of idea for, um, for why we might want to, or why it can be a good way to introduce, or why, sorry, let's say that again, why it can be helpful in models to introduce uh, prior distributions which bring together um, the latent parameters of some, uh, of some objects or some, some kind of measurements we're trying to take. So the way that that works in, um, in hierarchical models is quite straightforward. 
Um, and most hierarchical models that we write down, which introduce latent variables, will probably, by their nature, have some type of shrinkage um, uh, introduced to the system. And so, um, and moreover, uh, we will probably introduce shrinkage in a direction which we also learn from the data, so we don't just uh, stick to the shrinkage towards zero, which um, the classical Stein estimator would use. We'll often try to learn what might be the optimum point to shrink to. So a Bayesian shrinkage model can look like this. It's going to be the same setting as Stein. We imagine we have normally distributed observations. So this is our likelihood. We're going to observe n objects, um, we label we'll called y, and this is our data. And uh, those data will be drawn from uh, a normal distribution for each one centered around the mean of the object um, and with a certain standard deviation. So we might imagine this as like estimates of galaxy mass which are noisy, but they're unbiased. So if we could observe each galaxy in the same process over and over again, we could average them and get a, get a good estimate. So we're going to have a single observation of the ga each galaxy's mass, which came with some noise. We're then going to introduce below that, in the second layer of the hierarchy, um, a, oh, I should say that this, um, uh, this mu here is a parameter of the model. It can be considered a latent variable because this represents the true galaxy mass. We never actually observe it, but it's something which we imagine to, to exist as a parameter. Um, and we give that a normal prior in which we'll share, we'll give a common mean and we'll introduce some kind of uh, covariance between the different galaxy masses which we'll try to learn in our Bayesian model. So. Um, uh, so this is how we might write very easily a Bayesian uh, shrinkage model. It's important to see that, um, well, I, as, I estimate, as, as I'll show in some subsequent examples, um, it's important to distinguish the results of Stein's theorem or Stein's result, uh, which is a frequentist uh, result describing a particular scenario, um, to distinguish that from the effect of Bayesian shrinkage. We know that Stein's phenomenon um, applies in these particular cases and, and for them shows that shrinkage can be a good thing. But outside of these relatively narrow examples, it won't guarantee for us that it's a good thing to do. So we need to think about what we're doing. In the, so in this example, uh, we might imagine applying shrinkage to the estimation of photometric redshifts. So the raw data that we have looks like this. These are redshift estimates that have been given to us from some kind of uh, um, spectral energy distribution fitting code. And uh, each one contains its own noise, which we're going to imagine is normally distributed or so forth. And we might say, well, what we could do is just say, for each galaxy, we're going to treat our best estimate of its redshift as whatever the SED fitting code gave. Um, and most likely, or just for this purpose, we'd assume that the SED fitting code didn't consider uh, any information about surrounding galaxies. It just looked at each galaxy one by one. Um, and so we could, we could take that estimator, and that's sometimes what people do. But um, we suspect, we might hypothesize, that um, we can do better by introducing a shrinkage estimator so in a Bayesian sense, the no, shrinkage con uh, the no shrinkage example would be just to imagine that the true distribution of redshifts, like over all possible galaxies we would observe in this survey, is just something that's uniform, maybe between a redshift of zero and, uh, and six or something. Um, but if we want to introduce a shrinkage estimator, um, then we can say, well, this distribution of, these, of true redshifts from which our observations came maybe is something that looks a little bit more like the actual data which we observed. So the first thing we could perhaps try would be like to introduce a normal distribution for the true value of the observed redshifts. Um, but it might, work, might, it might work well or it might not. The reason it might not work well in this case, um, we, which generally we would see by plotting the fitted uh, normal distribution against the observed data, um, but the reason it might not well work well for such data is that the data itself probably isn't very close to normally distributed. We know that redshifts are, uh, have a lower bound of zero, um, and 
because of the nature of the sort of galaxy selection function, we tend to have um, a lot of lower redshift galaxies and then some long tail of higher redshift, uh, you know, very lum ultra luminous objects stretching out. So a normal distribution um, to act on our latent variable is perhaps not a great choice. So then in the sort of model building process, we might get a fit like this and think, you know, like we're probably doing well with the shrinkage, but um, our model is actually not applying much of a shrinkage to any of the low redshift galaxies, and it might be, in a sense, over-shrinking or over-panelizing uh, the existence of very high redshift objects. So um, we might say, OK, we've got this model. We can, we can scrutinize it, but let's um, you know, try for a model which might be um, a little more powerful and effective. And so you could say, well, uh, I'm going to try like a skew normal distribution to just go add one extra parameter and allow my, um, my shrinkage distribution uh, to have a different sort of strength of shrinkage depending on what redshift we're working with. So these um, lower redshift objects, the noisier ones, will probably be shrunk uh, somewhat towards um, you know, values consistent with structure in the local universe, but then we don't over panelize this long tail of high redshift galaxies. Um, so this would be, I guess, just my um, advice for Recognizing, of, so this is advice for hierarchical model building in the sense of one, recognizing that there is this concept of shrinkage and that most hierarchical models which have latent parameters will be doing some kind of shrinkage. And then if we are going to be doing shrinkage to recognize that the type of, of prior distribution we give to those latent parameters will be um, shaping the nature of the shrinkage and maybe helping us or hindering us. So. Um, uh, you know, shrinkage is like, it's a powerful technique or tool, but it can be um, misapplied quite easily. And I've seen a number of astronomical examples where latent variables were not sort of uh, well treated in that sense. Um, possibly another way to obtain a, an effective shrinkage, which you might prefer, um, uh, if you, you know, particularly for the case of photometric redshifts, where we have a, a good idea of... Um, uh, something like the survey geometry and, and the, the selection limits of the survey would be to introduce a, um, a model which, which probably ends up with this type of parameterization, but which is based on, um, say, assuming kind of like a constant volume of galaxies of a given luminosity subject to the survey to the selection function of the survey, with some kind of free parameters for perhaps the mix of colors as a function of redshift. This type of thing would introduce many more parameters, physical parameters, to be estimated, but um, you know, could also give you this type of shrinkage. I tend to think about this type of data modeling um, more from a, I guess, from a, a consultancy point of view, where you're just thinking, how can I provide the best estimates, uh, you know, f in a kind of uh, in a pragmatic uh, way outside of outside of um, physical theory. But I think you can achieve much the same thing if you would work within the context of introducing uh, a shrinkage model based on, say, in this case, the survey geometry and volume density of galaxies. So the, yeah, the next thing to say is a little thing about um, uh, once we have a hierarchical model, um, how do we go about deciding whether we're doing the right thing to our data? So there's two questions to answer there. The first is, um, is my code actually producing a good approximation to the desired posterior? So in this sense, where it says your code, that probably means, in most cases, the, the, um, sort of, uh, the likelihood and, and priors that you wrote down within a, a given sampler, like STAN or JAGS. Um, and in this case, uh, you've not actually had to implement the MCMC code yourself. But um, it, this, this problem particularly, I would say, applies when you have to write your own sampler. Um, we want to test, is the sampler for this given is the sampler a good sampler to use for this particular model? So that'll be one question we'll look at. And this, the second question you want to ask um, is, is my model a good representation of, this, of the process which actually generated this data? Because you, as you can probably appreciate, we can write down more or less any model, just choose some likelihood function, some priors out of nowhere, and you can always fit it to the data, um, or almost always get a fit to the data, 
Um, but whether the model you chose was actually a good choice of model is, is a much more difficult question. Um, so we'll look at a couple of diagnostics of ways that you can uh, like test how you're doing in each of those. So for the first one, is my code producing a good approximation to the desired posterior? Um, I would say that for all of but the simplest models, we're going to need a computational algorithm for representing the posterior. So that's this is the idea of having to do some kind of MCMC sampling rather than just having an analytic formula we can write down um, to express the posterior. Uh, some of these algorithms that are available will only be, in some sense, like a first order approximation to the posterior, whereas others will give you a, will, in theory, give you a representation of the posterior, although in general that will be um, uh, in theory when the number of draws you take from that sampler goes towards infinity. And so obviously nobody runs the model for infinite time, and in many cases people will have a very restricted computational budget, so there's only sort of a certain number of samples you're likely to be able to draw from the posterior in a feasible amount of time. So we almost know for sure that um, our samplers aren't going to give us the exact or an exact representation of the posterior. So um, one thing to do, particularly when you've written a new code which you think is, uh, is achieving MCMC sampling from your model, is to try to check whether um, the posterior fits are in some sense sensible. So the way to do that is to try um, fitting or to try running the code to produce the posteriors that result from fits to mock data generated under known chosen values of the parameters. So you go ahead and uh, say choose, choose by hand your parameter values, draw some mock data, um, because we know that a, a proper Bayesian model, um, and particularly a Bayesian model when the priors are specified, defines a sampling distribution so we can draw from the likelihood, make this mock data, put it into our MCMC sampler, and then have a look, say visually, at what the posteriors for, the, for some different parameters look like. In this case, we might have uh, our parameters notated here as x and y. And uh, you know, we've, we've given true values in, um, these little red lines. And then we've run our sampler. And this is our, the histogram is our posterior for, say, 100 draws um, uh, for each of those two parameters. And looking by eye, it can be a little hard. You say, yeah, this looks, looks kind of reasonable. We know that our, as Brendan meant, pointed out yesterday, we don't expect our posterior to be uh, centered around the truth, because otherwise it would be very easy to identify the truth in each case. We'd just, uh, we'd just take the mean of the posterior and we'd be 100% sure that we had the right value. Um, but we do hope that the posterior has concentrated close to the true value. Um, so we look and we say, yeah, like it's pretty good here. It's not doing so well for this parameter. Um, and you just have a graphical summary where, you, where all you can really say is, by I, it looks sort of good or it looks sort of bad. It's not ideal. So what you want to do then, um, you know, this kind of plot will hopefully uh, reveal major problems, like if, uh, if the truth was way down here and, uh, and our, our distribution was up here, we'd say, oh, something's really wrong, it's probably a bug. But this type of analysis is pointing us like it's probably good, but we want to say something quantitative. So what you need to do is recognize that um, evaluating the accuracy of our sampling code is fundamentally a statistical problem in itself. So, um, and that sometimes the data which we draw, the mock data from the model, uh, will simply be an unlucky drawer of data for, that, from those, for those particular chosen parameters. So we're going to want to repeat simulations. Um, so do this process of, of setting, um, setting uh, choosing parameter values, drawing mock data, extracting the po posterior. Uh, we're going to want to repeat this a bunch of times. Um, you might then say, well, what parameters do we want to choose for this exercise? Um, it seems a bit arbitrary to just choose um, our favorite parameters and, and see if the model does well on those. Uh, so instead, a very good thing to do is to, um, uh, is to draw random sets of parameters at each time that you draw a mock data set and draw those from the prior itself. So um, we have a, a somewhat tautological relationship uh, such that if we apply this process where we draw some parameters from the prior, draw some mock data sets under those parameters, um, extract the posterior, 
and then, um, and then check, for example, some test statistic whether um, our, let's say, how much of our posterior mass lies below the input true value of that parameter. Um, this test statistic in particular, this, um, uh, which I should say again, just in, in case you missed it, this statistic is how much of our, or how many, or what proportion of our posterior samples uh, in a given single parameter lie below the true value of that parameter. So it's a number which is going to be from zero to one. Uh, this statistic should have, um, if we're drawing parameters from the prior, mock data sets from the likelihood, and uh, our posterior is, is, well, our MCMC sampler is returning the true posterior, they should have a, um, a distribution which is um, uniform under, the, under this um, null hypothesis of a well-performing sampler. So what do you do? You, um, it's kind of expensive in, in terms of computational time, but um, if you have written your own sampler, um, you've probably invested already a lot of time writing that down, so it makes sense to um, spend a similar amount of time confirming that it works or at least a non-trivial amount of time doing so. Um, so what you do, you, you draw your parameters from the prior, you draw your mock data sets, you compute the posterior, figure out how much of the posterior mass lies below the um, true parameter value in each case, and then you can take all of those, those values and plot them as a histogram. Ideally, we're going to want to see something which um, is relatively uniform, so it should be a flat distribution between 0 and 1. If you have a problem with your sampler, it's going to look in more or less in one of these particular archetypes. Um, this kind of U-shaped pattern will generally emerge when the posterior approximation is uh, much tighter, much more concentrated um, than it should be. So this is probably the worst case because we're, we're overly confident in a way that, um, you know, well, it's generally speaking better when dealing with statistical things not to be um, overly complicated uh, than, uh, sorry, overly confident than underconfident. Um, so here we're liable to uh, conclude too strongly uh, some kind of, um, uh, you know, some kind of statement based on our modeling. Um, the reason this is U-shaped uh, is because you can kind of imagine um, in order to get a, um, a value or to get a scenario where the most of the posterior mass is um, well below or well above the true parameter value, um, you'd have to really um, have a badly concentrated um, posterior that would look something like this. So if, if this type of situation happens a lot, um, it, you know, we're often uh, overconfident. We say, for sure, it's in here. But actually, a lot of the time, it's falling outside of those intervals. Then, we, then we're going to end up, a lot of times, either above or below uh, the true value um, and not covering the true value. Being a little um, underconfident will look like this. Um, so if our posterior is generally too broad, um, it's like we're hedging our bets a little bit too much. Uh, in this case, we get this, uh, this sort of inverted U shape. Um, and that's not too bad, but it does show you're perhaps not using your data as, as efficiently or as powerfully as you might like. Um, these are much rarer in my experience to find, but they could happen is if for some reason your sampler has a, a, a bias in one direction or another, you may well end up with one of these um, sort of uh, pyramid or half pyramid shaped functions. So the second side to posterior or to model checking, sorry, is to say, um, okay, if I have a sampler which works um, and works for this type of model, um, you might then ask, is the model that I've chosen itself actually a good representation of the data generation, generating process? So the first exercise, the checking if your sampler works that type of model, is something which you can do without having uh, received your actual data yet. Uh, the second part you have to do, or you want to do once you have the data, um, to see if your model was a good representation of the process that led to that data. There's a couple of ways to answer that question. Uh, it's tempting in a Bayesian framework to do it entirely, or you might be tempted to do it by model selection. So this is indeed a, a topic we've not covered strongly, but um, it is possible in the Bayesian framework to use the marginal likelihood, the normalizing constant itself, as a, as a test statistic or as a, um, uh, as, a, as a weighting for the relative merits of two different models. 
And so you could say, well, I have this model, and then maybe I have some kind of alternative model. So for example, uh, you know, my model for the malaria, you could say I just have as a base model the model which only takes the linear predictors, and then as the more complicated model, I'll take the model which is the linear predictors plus the Gaussian process, and I'll compare which of those two is better, given the observed data, using Bayesian model selection. That, for me, is not a very sensible way to do model building for this type of thing. It's a different discussion if we're talking about hypothesis testing motivated by some uh, comparison of two, say, um, physical models, like two cosmological models, which, for which we have a ex designed experiment. But for the case of simply building a model which we want to uh, use, say, to predict future data or, or to, um, uh, for this type of task, um, our choice of model is often um, uh, not so uh, so binary, for one thing, we usually don't just have a small family of competing models. You know, I could have chosen, instead of a Gaussian process, um, some uh, simpler, say, moving spline representation, or you know, I could really come up with a huge number of possible models. So um, yeah, it becomes uh, just a, not a very effective way uh, to pursue the problem of, of model checking with these marginal likelihoods. The other thing is that um, uh, Computing the model like marginal likelihood, the evidence is computationally expensive, so um, generally that's also a, a disincentive to use it for this particular task. Um, so instead, uh, one sensible way to do model checking or to, to explore the nature or the ways in which your model might not be performing well is to apply one of these things called a posterior predictive check. The idea is to construct some kind of test statistics to compare against the observed data, but we're not going to do it using the prior, which is too diffuse. We're going to do it using uh, the posterior itself as our baseline. Um, you might say, and people often do say, well, it doesn't seem very good because that's using the data twice. In this sense, you know, you use the data once to get the posterior, um, and then you're going to use the data again, uh, you know, to test the model. Um, that's, I would say that's not a fair criticism, but it does uh, identify one potential uh, problem with the way that people interpret posterior predictive checks, uh, which is that the um, expected distribution under the null for the posterior predictive check uh, will not be a uniform, or will not always be a uniform distribution. So when we get a posterior predictive check where we say, um, in, say in this case, we, we might have run the check, and we say, well, um, our observed data looks very similar in some sense to mock data sets drawn from the posterior. We'll say, well, it's, it's fine, and, and so we're, we're not going to reject the null. But if we did have, um, like our observed data was, seemed to be in the tail of what we would have expected, we're not going to interpret that as a, tail posterior, as a tail probability where we'll say, oh, we reject the, um, you know, our model at 95% confidence in a frequent sense. We're not going to do that type of of p-value based test because the p-value doesn't have a meaning here. Um, but what we will say is, well, it looks unusual. Why does it look unusual? Um, and then we'll, we'll try to refine the model uh, in, in that direction. So um, uh, yeah, although people would, like people who promote the posterior predictive check would refute the idea um, that it's invalid because of using the data twice, um, it's, the criticism does inform how you should think about the tests. Uh, and so there's a good paper by Andrew Gelman uh, which uh, discusses this, this type of, um, uh, which shows two cases in which um, you can apply, apply these checks, so one where they work well and one where it doesn't. Um, one issue with the posterior predictive check is that it's relies, it's up to the user, <coughs> it's up to the user to identify what kind of st test statistic is going to reveal uh, you know, a meaningful way in which the model may or may not be wrong. So um, an example would be if I had a model for the malaria um, prevalence distribution across Africa in which I didn't have a Gaussian process term, um, I just had the linear fit, I could look at the residuals of that model and my posterior predictive test statistic might be a measure of how correlated the residuals were um, as you got closer and closer together. So for two villages, as they became closer, how, how much did the error, uh, or did the residuals of my model correlate? And so that, in that case, I 
I know, um, or I have a good sense already um, before I start what might be a way in which the model without a Gaussian process could be wrong. So I know what to do. If I don't know what to do, then um, uh, one way in which you can criticize the model in the, in the same sense, in the same, in the same way as using the posterior distribution, uh, is to look at a leave one out strategy. So to say, we're not going to focus on how um, our model is wrong with regard to a user-specified test statistic. We're rather going to look at it in something which would probably be considered more um, uh, sort of objective or more standardized, which is in terms of its um, predictive performance when we leave out one by one a given piece of data. So um, what we usually do for this would be to have um, some kind of uh, n-fold cross-validation strategy or even just to leave one out cross-validation strategy. Um, and we'll, so what we'll do is we'll take, uh, take our sample, say our sample of um, 100 galaxies with uh, measured bar fractions, um, and over a number of different uh, repeated trials, we'll randomly remove one of those galaxies from the sample, extract the posterior, and then we'll ask the question, uh, given the, the sort of model that we're fit, um, uh, do we, um, or how much of the posterior predictive distribution for that left out galaxy lies below the actual observed value uh, that we had? It's, um, for any given galaxy, you'll get a single number, which is um, between 0 and 1. Again, it's much like um, in the original case, it's very hard to interpret. If you just did it once, it wouldn't be very meaningful. But if you were to repeat this for like many times, you leave out different galaxies each time randomly, then um, you would hope to, if your model is well calibrated, to achieve again a um, uh, uniform distribution of this leave one out test statistic. And the um, types of diagnostics you get actually are very similar uh, to the case for the original um, sampler calibration, which is that um, when we get one of these inverted, or sorry, one of these U-shaped uh, distributions, we find that the model we've chosen seems to be overconfident. Um, and if it's uh, uh, this sort of arch shape, then the model is underconfident. So um, this, this type of test is called, a, is called the PIT test, or the um, uh, um, posterior integral transform, or sorry, probability integral transform applied to the, to the posterior. It's been used uh, a little bit in astronomy, and there's some, uh, a couple of, of good astronomical papers um, by people who, who work with cosmological random fields that, it, that give some more detail on this. Um, and it's something actually that we use a lot at work. So when I mentioned that our, our um, aim is to do very well in two areas in terms of uh, the predictive accuracy for leave one out, so in mean squared error, but then also in, in probability, uh, in, sort of in terms of model calibration, uh, it's this type of diagnostic which we would use to represent calibration. And if we, we can find a model that does well in this type of test and, and uh, um, it allows us to show uh, that not only are we doing well in terms of um, predicting what malaria would be at a given location, but also in expressing our uncertainties about it. Um, so one final thing that's worth saying on the model checking is that um, a nice property of most Bayesian models is that they will have some frequentist guarantees. So if we, in the limit that we have, uh, you know, sort of an increasing amount of data, um, and we're not changing our model, so we're just adding more and more data to that model, um, the Bayesian and frequentist results, uh, or posterior estimates, will often coincide. And so, it, to me, it makes, uh, makes some sense, um, and in some cases a good deal of sense, to see for our given model whether there is also some kind of frequentist test uh, to support our, our model checking experiments. And you're probably familiar with this um, uh, likelihood ratio test, also called the chi-squared test, um, or reduced chi-squared test, uh, which is used a lot in astronomy. Um, and it, with, for certain nicely behaved models, uh, it has this asymptotic uh, chi-squared distribution, so that we can, if we know the asymptotic distribution, and we know what the, dis what the, uh, the value of the chi-squared statistic is for our sample, we can um, make a frequentist type of statement as to whether it seems that, our, that we have a good model. It's often 
uh, quite strongly criticized in astronomy because it has historically been misused. Um, and this, like, so this paper in particular gives a, um, uh, a thorough account of, of some of the ways it can be misused and where, where it fails. The key places where it fails are actually quite straightforward to identify, so you shouldn't fall into this trap. Um, so one of the places where it fails is where the um, null model um, that we're going to test lies on the boundary point of the, um, uh, of the more sophisticated model that encloses it. So I should actually back up a minute to say the likelihood ratio test is applied when we have nested models. So for example, if we have a, um, one model in which um, uh, the galaxies in, you know, say, in my survey have a normal distribution of colors um, and, uh, you know, the, and this is a base model, with perhaps with some simple predictive variable, and then the nested model would say we, it, they have that distribution plus there's an, addi an additional term which acts at the cluster level, so given clusters uh, take a particular offset, then those models are nested um, and we could apply a likelihood ratio test. When we talk about this boundary, it's for, um, which, it's for the parameters which are added to the more complicated model. And the null model is the simpler model. So um, by far the most common example of, of a boundary case in astronomy is where we have some extra variance term. So if we say there's like um, an extra piece of noise in the model which affects, say, the value of colors um, by cluster, so it depends on cluster versus a model where you ignore, cluster, ignore which clusters galaxies belong to. Uh, if it's a variance term, it has to be uh, something greater than zero. So the null model is imagining that the variance is zero. Um, the more complicated model is imagining that there's this extra term with non-zero variance. Um, since you can't have a negative variance, uh, in some sense, by definition, uh, the null model must lie on a boundary. In this case, there is actually an easy fix because um, uh, there's some papers which, uh, uh, which have been identified in the astronomy literature, and particularly in the um, uh, particle physics literature for, for testing new particles. They, they're not stupid. They, they know that this can be a problem, like uh, the model which has, uh, say, a non-zero uh, mass for some kind of new particle versus a, a, a model where the, that new particle doesn't exist. This type of, or sorry, is massless, I should say. Uh, in this case, you can still proceed, and the new statistic, or the, it no longer takes a chi-squared distribution, so you don't just apply the chi-squared test. It actually takes a distribution which is a mixture of chi-squared distributions, so um, uh, you know, it's, it's more complicated, but you can proceed and not get into trouble. Where, where it really gets difficult is when um, the model has this non-identifiability condition or a sort of a, a singularity um, of the information matrix. It sounds abstract. The way to, to really see it is to see if you have a model which has, um, say, the complicated model has, has a number of free parameters, and if you would choose, specify uh, all of those parameters to have the, the null value except for one, um, if that additional parameter um, is not at all informed by the data in that case, then, you'll, then the chi-squared test will break down. To make that more concrete, the way is to, th well, one example would be if you look at an emission line model in which we imagine um, that we know the location of the emission line, but we don't quite know what its height is compared to the continuum. So a model with a, sort of a single emission line, and we, we know where it is, we're just going to estimate its height. That model's fine and if we're testing that against the continuum model where there's no emission line. Um, but what would not be fine is if the location is also unknown because under the null model, which is that there's only continuum, uh, the null would be that the emission line parameter, um, the emission line strength is zero. But if the strength was zero, if we fixed that, and we, then we tried to estimate the location of the emission line from our data, um, we would have no information to estimate it because the location is effectively meaningless uh, once we set that, that height to zero. Um, and this paper in particular uh, by Protasov and David Van Dyke and some other astrostatisticians uh, does a very good job of, of um, sort of uh, fleshing out these, these type of cases where that, that situation doesn't hold. One additional model check that you might want to look at 
is um, to look at an information statistic, which um, these can be used to rank uh, possible models. Uh, one, there's, a, there's a quite a few of these. The one that I like the most is this one called the Deviance Information Criterion. It's, it tries to do something which is a little similar to um, computing the marginal or comparing marginal likelihoods, but it recognizes that that's expensive, and so we're, we're not going to want to actually do that. Um, usually it involves more than just uh, sampling from the posterior um, to, to get the full marginalized likelihood. What the DIC says is, well, we'll make a kind of crude approximation to it just using drawers from the posterior, um, and in particular, we, we're going to compare the, um, uh, the mean log likelihood under the posterior against the um, log likelihood at the mean of the parameters. So um, you just compare these values. And the um, uh, directionality of it is that um, a lower DIC uh, of one model compared to another is considered to be um, a pointer towards the direction that that model is a better model. There's more details on the DIC statistic in Martin Plummer's uh, biostatistics paper. And then Andrew Little has also uh, some applications of, of the DIC in the case of cosmological model selection, which I think are quite informative. I noticed recently when I was reading uh, a little bit about the DIC uh, on Andrew Gelman's blog, he mentioned that um, Estimating the DIC maybe is, for some models, quite unstable in the sense that even long after the MCMC sampler seems to have found uh, you know, a stationary distribution for the model parameters, the value of the DIC is fluctuating around a lot. So if you are using the DIC, uh, it makes sense maybe to do like a trace plot of what the, the DIC looks like computed with the samples available up to a given point and see how that see whether that is indeed settling down or whether it's still continuing to fluctuate and on that basis decide whether you trust it or not. My very final thoughts about this um, sort of abstract process of model building or the sort of meta model building thought is um, number one advice would be to, con to come back to this point about thinking generatively. Like, imagine when you're building a hierarchical model, all the steps that led you to have this sample of data, which you now have in your hand. And uh, in imagining that process, um, uh, you know, you'll probably, you'll probably branch out and, and find a lot of things which, uh, you know, which you may well not be able to, to represent well with a model, but you can, you can trim those back later on. Um, and so I say start conceptually, like um, maybe not even choose or try to specify distributions for each of the steps that generated the data, um, but just try to write them down. So, you know, if you have like some uh, phot photometry for a star, you start by writing down how, do, where does the model come from? It comes from the telescope, it goes through the data reduction pipeline, it has read noise, it has these sources of error. And you can, you can basically write that down as a sort of as a flow diagram or, or so, or maybe just even as a, as a hierarchical model written with words rather than mathematical equations. And then once you're happy that you understand where the data came from, you can then look for each piece or each step in that process, um, what might be the appropriate um, statistical distribution to describe the randomness um, which, it, which exists, or the sources of random noise. Uh, don't be afraid to add latent variables to the model. I'd say building a sampler is really the second phase of your analysis. And in a vast majority of cases, you'll be able to plug in a sampler which somebody else has written and tested um, and which has you know, very great uh, or very fast performance on a, on a modern computer. So, so don't restrict yourself artificially in terms of model complexity um, to begin with. Um, at least in the, in the conceptual stage. And if it does turn out eventually that the model has to be reduced because of um, computational uh, constraints in the fitting, then at least you've gone through the process of identifying what the optimal model was. And uh, you know, realistically, you should report or acknowledge um, you know, that uh, what decisions were made for computational reasons versus what decisions were made um, because you, know, you genuinely think that that's the nature of the model. Having said that, when you actually start coding the model, definitely do start simple. Start with a very simple, uh, you know, truncated version of your model, um, and gradually increase the complexity. Uh, I definitely spend a lot 
too much of my own time uh, debugging models where I started too complicated and, uh, and you know, got bogged down because of a, a simple um, sort of uh, coding error in computing the likelihood function or, or doing something simple like this. So um, uh, conceptually, don't restrict yourself, but then, practicing when, or then in practice when you're coding, start simple and build your way up to the most complicated model that you want to fit. Um, I'll just have a quick break there, a quick brain break for, say, five minutes um, uh, to let you guys absorb that and maybe uh, chat with each other about uh, parts you are uncertain about, or, or, and you can ask me questions at lunch. And then, do we have lunch at uh, one or one? one? OK, so then I'll give 10 minutes on the Laplace approximation. And when we come back after lunch, we can do the, um, we can do finish those slides and do the exercises. Uh, it looks like we're running behind schedule, but I did build in a fair bit of redundancy because the um, final session of an hour and a half was allocated to just uh, two exercises, which in principle can be done much more quickly than an hour and a half. So um, I'm not worried about getting a little bit behind just now. Um, cool. Very good. Um, please thank our speaker. I added all the slides from the presentation to the web page. So if you go to the web page and reload, you'll see a new link to his slides. Um, it's a big file. I put it on Dropbox. It's like 80 megabytes or something. So you need to download it from, uh, from my Dropbox.